Thank you so much, uh, Nate, for that extremely gracious and, uh, and well-prepared introduction. I, I try always to have new goals and ambitions, so now I have the one to live to 100 and continue to, <laughs> to be a journalist and, until then. This is on my mind because of the reason that Deb is not here with me. Her mother, uh, age 97, had until two days ago been driving her own car still in Florida. Uh, she drove it, unfortunately, into a wall. And she's going to be okay. The car is not, but Deb is. Uh, Deb sends her wishes from Englewood, Florida, where she is taking care of her mom. And I'll tell her. Her her mother still performs piano recitals at age 97. And though I have no blood connection to my mother-in-law, I will use this event of the high school lecture uh, lectureship as being a connection, giving both me and her a, a, a goal. So, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. It's a delight to be in Little Rock, where I've been many, many times over the years and have many friends who are, are here. I'm grateful to uh, Skip Rutherford and the Clinton School for having me here. I'm grateful in particular, as Nate mentioned, to Bill Whitworth, who's sitting here for 20 years, my editor at The Atlantic, and much, many of the, most of the articles I did that had any kind of traction and success in the world were under Bill's leadership, which I'm grateful for. I had dinner with Bill last night, and we were both reminded that one source of our successful relationship is that we disagree on a lot of things. So we were, we were hashing those things out. But I'm, I'm happy to be with you in, in your town to tell you about, about our towns. And because I know uh, of, of the honor of this distinguished lectureship is for one of the pioneering reporters and journalists and editors of this part of, of the country, I've been thinking about the particular journalistic angle I should present uh, this evening. And uh, it's not going to be one that I hatched with under Bill Whitworth's uh, watchful eye 22 years ago when I was doing a book called Breaking the News, How the Media Undermine American Democracy. That was back in what now seems like an Edenic lost age. Uh, it, was, it was true that, that uh, one illustration of the Lost Eden was that Fox News was only about three weeks into an, its existence when I, I published that book. Uh, it's also the case that one of my main arguments there was how important it was for journalism to try to maintain the separation in concept between sheer entertainment and information of some sort. Because once you got into an entertainment battle, entertainment would always win. That's what it is for. Uh, again, that seems somewhat a quaint concept to think back on, that there could be any separation between the two. But I will, I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, I'm going to have a journalistic angle on what you heard from Nate, which is the way Deb and I have spent the past five years of our, our lives, and how it is all related to the understanding a country has of itself, communities have of themselves, families and organizations and libraries and all the rest uh, ha have of themselves because the essential argument I'm making, Deb and I are making in our book, is that something has gone awry in the way 20, the, the 21st century United States is able to understand its strengths, its weaknesses, its position in the world, its prospects, and I argue that distorted perspective has made it harder to deal with the genuine problems the United States has uh, than it would otherwise be or than, than, it, than it could be. Before telling you that, I'm going to give you one other angle on my basic attitude about the U.S. As Nate mentioned, I've been a long-term optimist by outlook. I think that, that comes from my father in particular, uh, not so much my mother, who was sort of chronically moody and depressed, but my, my dad was a very, his nickname as a boy had been Sonny Jim. And as a small town doctor in California, he carried that out. But the, the plot line of almost everything I've written for The Atlantic and a few other publications and in books over the years has been the question of, is the U.S. going to make it? As you think of the long saga of American tragedies and injustices and successes and innovations, what is the current balance in those hydraulic forces about whether the evils and the burdens and the chaos in the United States, is it how are those going to match up with the self-renewing capacity the U.S. has had for, for, for decades and, and, and decades? 
And the argument I made back in 2010 in the article you, uh, you heard referred to after I'd been living with Deb in China for four years was essentially that America's national government was a problem and it wasn't getting, getting uh, any better and that only a country with as much going for it as the U.S. has could withstand a national governing structure like the one we have, which was you know, uh, built for an entirely different uh, civilization, entirely different population mix, et cetera, than, than we have now. But in continuing this saga, the question of is the U.S. going to make it, Deb and I decided to try to extend the journalistic practice we had carried out in China, where we were for four plus years, and Malaysia for a couple of years, and Japan for a few years, and other parts of the world, to our own domestic territory. And always looking for ways to get out of Washington, where we're based otherwise, we, uh, we, we decided to try to, to take a look at the parts of the United States that the normal media spotlight tended to skip right past. And by that, I meant essentially any place in the US that was not New York or DC or Seattle or San Francisco or one of the few other big, big metropolises. Um, I don't know whether Bill Whitworth was actually at the New Yorker as an editor when they had that famous Saul Steinberg cover of how the world looks from the east side of Manhattan with the vivid detail of about a quarter mile of Manhattan and then a bunch of nothing, and then the Rocky Mountains, and then nothing, and then Los Angeles. But there is a version of that that comes through in, uh, comes through almost uh, inescapably in the national media's portrayal of the country in that everybody in this room has a mental map of New York, even, though if, we, even if we've never lived there, as I never have. We know something similar about parts of Boston and DC from House of Cards, and Los Angeles from every action movie you've ever seen, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but what the city of Omaha actually looks like, or what it is like in Des Moines, or what's it like in Sioux Falls, or in Birmingham, Alabama, or all the rest, this is something that's not part of the usual landscape uh, of the media, and with exceptions that in a way uh, approve the rule. Those exceptions, as you know, you'll get national film crews if there is a disaster, you know, a shooting, an explosion, et cetera, et cetera. If there is a political campaign, distinguishing that from a disaster for the moment, and people will, doubt, <laughs> will come to you know, every diner in Iowa or in Western Pennsylvania and talking to people about what they think. Or if there is what we used to think of as concept pieces. You get the idea in the editing studio in, in New York or DC or London, say, let's go see how people in the heartland are feeling about X and you pick out a, um, a place on the map in the heartland and see what they are, are feeling at. Um, off the record, I will tell you, I was in London for uh, quite a while last year and talking with the BBC about doing some election-oriented uh, special that I was going to narrate for them uh, this fall about the U.S. midterms. And their whole premise was, well, let's find a place where we know there are angry, displaced industrial workers and see what's happening, you know, go there. Just picking a, a city as the background grid for a pre-established idea of what, of what was, was, uh, was going on. Um, you can excuse that with them because they are foreigners, and, but I think that this is a, a tendency of our, our own national media too. And so what Deb and I thought we would try to do is to approach places that were not normally in the news and treat them not as background grids for either national politics or for a disaster story or a concept story, uh, but instead try to treat them as you would an independently interesting place, whether it was uh, DC or Rome or anything of the sort. And five years ago on the Atlantic's website, I put up a post uh, saying, We'd like to know the story of your town and why it is representative of the U.S. We're talking now a few years uh, after the depths of the financial crash. We're talking just after Obama has been re been reelected, and we'd like to know about cities. Number one, that are smaller, which meant not part of the national media, uh, you know, spotlight. So, for example, one place we went was Columbus, Ohio, which is a giant city. 
but it's not normally covered the way that a coastal city is. We are looking for cities that had a problem of some kind, a factory closing, a political crisis, something that, that was a challenge for the city, and we are looking for ones that had some kind of interesting story from, from their response. And within a week, we got about a 1,000 essays from people saying, here's where you should come. Quite a number of cities in Arkansas were represented that. Little Rock and El Dorado and Bentonville and Fort Smith, I think those are the ones I can think of right off the top of our head, and, and you know, a 1,000 other places across the country. 49 of the 50 states were represented. I'll let you ask later which one was not. And we, we just started traveling. Um, we knew from our little airplane over the, the uh, years of flying around the country that you can get any place in the U.S. in a small plane because almost any place where people live is within 10 or 15 miles of a small airport. Also, it is uh, unbelievably beautiful to see the American landscape from 2,000 feet up. And you can see why cities are where they are, and you can see the things they're featuring and the things they are hiding. Uh, it's two surprises on the east coast of America. You see in a small plane how it's essentially all forest. It really is incredible how forested the east coast is. You see also how many more prisons and quarries there are than you'd ever think from ground level. You can tell as you're flying into a city, there's a little tiny road that people don't usually go down and a big prison there or a big quarry or other things of that sort. And we traveled all, all over and just uh, our, our book, give us a sort of chronology of where we went. As far northeast as Eastport, Maine, a little city of 1,400 people. As far southwest as Ajo, Arizona, another about 2,000 people down by the Mexican border. Northwest in Oregon, a lot of time in, not in Arkansas, but a lot of time in South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi especially, and a little bit in Alabama. A lot in the industrial heartland, big cities, small cities. As time went on, we began spending more and more time, we sort of went down the economic scale to places that were doing worse and worse, uh, ending up in San Bernardino, which is right next to where I grew up in the town of, of Redlands, and in western Kansas, uh, Dodge City and Garden City, and in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is having all of its industrial shutdowns. And we ended up writing hundreds of web posts and doing radio reports and doing some Atlantic video and we're doing an HBO documentary. And we ended up deciding that we needed to do a book because we thought it was important to do our little part to try to swing the lever of self-understanding from the United States based on what we had seen. The essential way we wanted to turn the lever was to extend what I had written back in this article right when we returned from China, saying that the U.S. had lots of things on its side except for the national government. And the time since then seems the national government has become more and more troubled. Um, no matter your political affiliation, you can't be very happy about how the national government does its fundamental function which is matching a nation's resources, which are enormous for the United States, with a nation's challenges, which are also enormous. And there is not any real meshing of gears for the U.S. in that way. So, but we're arguing that at just that time, when the national government seems polarized and paralyzed and people are unhappy about it, et cetera, et cetera, in the parts of the United States that people knew firsthand, their own communities, their own regions sometimes, there was generally a sense of movement in the right direction. Not an absence of problems. Opioids are a terrible problem. Economic dislocation is of course happening. There are, race is the enduring American crisis, et cetera, et cetera. So every problem that we all think America has, it actually has. What was surprising was that most people felt that the parts of the country they lived in were moving in the right direction rather than the wrong direction. That there was a there-ness to the interior of America that wasn't like that Steinberg cartoon, that was feeling as if it was getting some traction, and there seemed to be actual polling data to support this, uh, th this contention. 
in that over the last generation, the percentage of people who feel that the country as a whole is going in the right direction has gone down and down and down. And it's now somewhere 25, 28% of the people think things are going in the right direction. But this percentage of people who feel their own communities are going in the right direction is now nearly 80%. You know, most people think the country is getting worse and their part of the country is getting better. And that somehow this contradiction involves realities of economics and community development, but also journalism. So let me now give you some details supporting my perhaps implausible contention, and then how I think this comes back to the themes of journalistic, journalism, civic engagement, and all the rest. If we, when Deb and I looked back at some of the web postings we were doing five years ago, when we began our journey in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I had never been, and it was the first place we started thinking, gee, why don't we live here? I mean, there were some answers to why we didn't live there, but it was, it was a, a, plausible, a, a plausible question. You know, you could, we could see in the tone of our reports a sort of initial, gee whiz, there actually is something here, and this here in the next town too, and the next town too, and the next town too, and then we began to see some patterns and some predictable surprises or some recurring surprises, and I'll list some of these off. Uh, just to give you a sort of a sense of what I think I know now that I didn't know five years ago. The reason I love being a journalist is that you have to, you get to, and from now for the next 30 plus years of my life uh, to become, till I'm, and when I'm a reporter at age 100, <laughs> is you get to keep educating yourself about new things. You, it's a continual lifelong, uh, you know, seeing other, other people's uh, life experience. And some of these things that, that I believe now because I've seen them, not at one place or three places, but 15 places, are, are the following. One of them is uh, what I, I think of as a reverse talent dispersal or reverse osmotic flow, by which I mean we all know that in Europe over the centuries and through American history, there's been a concentration of people from farm to village to small town to bigger town to New York and Chicago and LA, and from the English countryside to London and all these things, this happens o over history. And those forces, of course, still apply. Seattle and San Francisco are becoming huge, huge hubs. DC will always be there. But it was striking how often we found people who either had worked in DC, San Francisco, or some other metropolis, or London, or could have worked in those places, and decided that instead, the overall life balance was better for a dozen different reasons in Sioux Falls, or Duluth, or Little Rock, or Greenville, or Allentown, or Erie, or Redlands, California, my hometown, or any of, of these other things. And the reasons, partly this involves um, real estate arbitrage, that the city of Fresno uh, in California, which is traditionally non-stylish, has been luring people from the Bay Area of San Francisco by, by just saying, look, our real estate costs one-fifth as much as yours does. To raise a family, to do a startup, to have an arts troupe, you can do different things here. Often, uh, communications technology has made this possible in many industries, uh, lots of other factors. Often, we found there was some family connection you married somebody from Sioux Falls and wanted to go back there, you had gone to college there, you had grandparents there, there was something that made you think this place was connected to you. But every place we went, there were people like that who thought they could do first tier activity in what had been seen as not the biggest centers. And so it doesn't mean Seattle won't keep growing, but there's a lot of other places growing too. We saw a surprising uh, next on the sort of surprises list was a surprising functionality of local politics. I don't know enough about Little Rock local politics to get in the middle of anything that's happening here. Uh, I, I've learned to be cautious about getting, talking about things I don't, uh, that where I know I don't know enough. But lots of other places, you had the sense that the current mantra, American, America is more divided than ever before, is true at one level of American life involving the Senate and the Congress and national politics, but is not true of a lot of other things that people do. 
the example that stuck to me early on is that relatively back to back, we were in Burlington, Vermont, and Greenville, South Carolina. And on national politics, these are polar extremes. Greenville, Trey Gowdy's home base, before that, Jim DeMint, home of Bob Jones University, last county in the last state to recognize uh, Martin Luther King's birthday. Burlington, Vermont, it's literally the case that the parties on the ballot are the Democrats and the Socialists and then the, for the local elections. And Bernie Sanders was a Socialist mayor there. But it struck us after we, were, we saw the places back by back, if you didn't know they were opposites, you would think they were the same place, you know, that they functioned the same way. And I had the joy of connecting the Republican mayor of Greenville, Knox White, with the Democratic, therefore conservative, mayor of Burlington, <laughs> Moreau Weinberger. And they're sharing all their things of how they developed their waterfront and what they were doing in technical education, and dealing with refugees and things like that. And so, yes, there is national politics is more badly divided than in a long time, not worse than the Civil War, but, but in the ballpark after that. But local politics and the rest of life isn't, lots of places it is, is functional. We saw next on the list of just sort of general surprises a wave of institutional innovation we had not expected. Partly this involved the surprising to us central heroism of libraries across the country as institutions of civic engagement of all kinds. We had thought that in the digital age maybe libraries would be going the way of Walden books or something, that people would not want to be involved with them. But in, on the contrary, we saw in terms of internet connectivity and just civic connection and education of people and new kinds of activities that the, if you were looking for the re-knitting of American fabric, you would start at the library, and we usually did. Most places and towns, that was one of the places we, we went. Similarly, in a lot of public schools, we saw surprising experimentations, especially in the South. You know, I can think of particular cases in South Carolina and Georgia and Mississippi. I don't know enough Arkansas cases to name them of really creative public schools. And probably first on the list is one we wrote about in Greenville called the A.J. Wittenberg Elementary School of Engineering where they have little tiny kids in a public school in the poorest and least white part of town that are being taught engineering uh, by engineers from uh, BMW and Michelin and all the rest are there. We saw lots of other illustrations of institutional innovation t moving down the list of things that were surprises that we didn't know, and this is an important political one, is how the immigration drama is being played out right now on the city by city level. Uh, this is a theme that Bill Whitworth and I have been not debating, not arguing about, but considering with our complementary viewpoints for many, many decades. I did back in 1980. I did a big cover story for the Atlantic of traveling around and seeing how the Haitians were assimilating in Miami and the Vietnamese in Houston and, and all the rest. And so this has been of of, of, of interest to me, and what we saw is that what I consider to be the U.S. history of immigration, which is that it's never been easy, and that the Irish and the Germans and the Greeks and the Italians and the Poles and the Vietnamese and everybody at each stage of, of uh, immigrant arrival, there have been disruptions that come with ethnic change, language change, cultural change, and all the rest, but my contention is the power of the U.S. is that it's been able to, it's, it's, it's enveloping blob-like culture has been able to include most immigrant groups and make them feel like us rather than them as time goes on. And I contend, Deb and I contended, that that's how it still seems at the local city-by-city -city level. In the Midwest, where there's been a very significant Latino uh, increase in population over the last generation, we generally found that to be the case. And I'll give you just one illustration of 20 that I might give. In the town of Holland, Michigan, which is Betsy DeVos's hometown, politically very conservative city, uh, settled originally, as you might guess, by Dutch people, 
and it's they're you know gigantic blonde people. If you follow football, Kirk Cousins, formerly of the Redskins, now of the Vikings, grew up in Holland, Michigan. He looks like most people in Holland except smaller. But it's <laughs> it's so Holland had been Dutch, and now it's majority Latino, uh, with the the uh, agricultural economy in Michigan. And there's over the last few years there have been tensions about funding the school system because the voters and taxpayers of Holland are mainly white, conservative, Dutch, Christian people or Protestant people, and the school children are increasingly Latinos. And Holland has passed a couple of big bond issues for its public school system. You know, people whose kids are not in the public schools have passed bond issues for the public schools. That's not something you expect on the national level now, but I could give you 20 more illustrations of that. And similarly, the places where we ran into fear of the newcomers, fear of the others, were mainly places where newcomers and the others weren't and had not arrived. Uh, not, 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 not arrived. Two illustrations. The state that has the lowest proportion of immigrants, of people born either not in the U.S. or not in the state, is the same state that gave the largest majority to Donald Trump. That state is West Virginia. And so it, you know, the, the places that tend to be most um, apprehensive about immigrants are ones that have received uh, fewest of them. And a, a similar illustration of that would be that Steve King, a Republican congressman from Iowa, comes from either the, of all the 435 congressional districts, his is either the second or third whitest district. And he's the one who has been, you know, sort of most um, assertive in, in, in preventing the immigrant threat. We argue that city by city, it's actually working out and that most data will support this as well. That people uh, don't seem to be alarmed by the reality of their local immigration situation, but even though they may be concerned in, in principle. Um, we have a few other surprises, but I'm going to uh, just tell you about two of them and then I'll, I'll move on to some of the journalistic payoff. One of the, these surprises was a new appreciation for the power of self-image and the civic narrative, by which I mean, it strikes me as the years go on, as I get towards my centennial mark, that, that almost everyone in the United States is hyper aware of being looked down on by someone else. You know, maybe there are places that's not true. Maybe certain parts of Manhattan or West Side LA or Boston or whatever, but most of the US is aware of somehow being disadvantaged. I'm not even talking about racial disadvantages, of course, which are the, the historic one or gender disadvantages, but regional ones. The Midwest versus the coasts, the South versus the non-South. Uh, inland California, where I'm from again, versus the coast, coastal California, the Dakotas versus uh, anything else. For, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Mississippi, Mississippi and West Virginia are in their respective ways hyper aware of what their two state na names um, mean. Um, I, I, I won't even give you illustrations about that, but it's, I'll say that between the ages of two and five, I lived in Mississippi. My dad was a Navy doctor there. I tried to pass myself off as a local when I was traveling through Mississippi, but they were not, they were not buying it. But I, but I, I said that I, I could understand, actually, the, the allusions to Mississippi. And what was fascinating is, is both how people are aware of this and the ways that it can be either a disabling or a motivating uh, feature. And lots of cities, the struggle was between older people who had the idea of in Fresno, nothing works, in Erie, nothing works, in West Virginia, nobody wants to be here, and people, their children's generation, who said, yeah, we're tired of this kind of whining, and we're gonna show you that we can do this in Mississippi, we can do it in Fresno. The joke version of how this applies in Fresno is calling the city Fres, yes. This is a part of the, <laughs> so when you go there, you can call, call them that. So the, the embracing the civic identity and civic narrative, that was interesting to me too. San Bernardino, this is a very big theme of San Bernardino, which has been the most troubled town in California. And the final sort of surprise on this list was the potential of a new wave of people who have experience making things actually happen. 
of, we know that in the congressional races this cycle, there's a lot of young veterans and a much larger number of women and a racially much more diverse field coming into congressional races. I think there may also be in the future a wave of people who are not mayors like Mike Bloomberg or Rahm Emanuel, but smaller town mayors or entrepreneurs or people who have been librarians or people who have been doing things at the the local level who will be able to present a story in their political narrative saying, look, we've seen that things don't need to be the way they are when you turn on cable TV. There's a different face of the country that we can, can, can represent. So I have a longer list of surprises, but I, I will sort of move on to what this means civically and what it means journalistically. In the civic sense. I am aware, and all of you are, you know, as aware as I am, that there is never any exact historical parallel and things are always different and you can't make two direct linkages of anything. But I do, I find myself during the time of our travels, I spend all my time reading histories and American literature from the original Gilded Age era, from 1870 to just after World War I just because there are so many parallels of corruption in politics and cynicism about politics and corruption in the judiciary and rapid ethnic change and the rapid rise of new fortunes and the disappearance of old ways of life and all these things that we can see analogs to in our current era. And this is absorbing to me partly because it is so resonant. I've, over the last year or so, for my sins, I've read my way through the entire oeuvre of Theodore Dreiser, who is simultaneously the worst writer ever to grow up in America and the greatest writer to ever grow up in America. And sentence by sentence, it is terrible, but these are such powerful works, and they could have been written about 2018, and even, if they're, even though they're said 100 years ago. And as I think of this parallel between our problems now and our problems a hundred years ago when Deb's grandparents were all arriving from Central Europe and, uh, and my forebears were, one of my forebears was arriving from Germany and uh, the, all the, the, the struggle the US was going through. I try to balance on the one hand awareness of the similarities of the problems with on the other hand all the responsive renewal efforts that came from that same time too, of the civic reform movements that were pioneered in California but had their connections across the country and that, that Teddy Roosevelt was involved in, and the environmental movement with John Muir and others, and W.B. Du Bois and the Black Rights Movement and the Women's Suffrage Movement and Jane Addams and a zillion other movements that you can name that grew, and the labor movement of course, that it grew up in a dispersed way and organically, but as time went on, they acquired more critical mass. And although it took two world wars and a depression, which you would prefer to avoid, and the Nazis and everything else, um, there, was, there was a sort of field of, of laboratories of democracy that could be applied when the national political conditions made that possible. And so my hope the path that I hope the U.S. can take through the woods at the moment is to have to recognize this dispersion of people who city by city actually feel as if they're making connections. They're reinventing community colleges. They're reinventing libraries. They're having startups in unexpected places. They're attracting people and making government seem more viable again. And so that there will be ideas and approaches and people and a sense of, a, of both possibility and exasperation that at some point soon in national life, if the national fever burns itself out, there will be a different, um, different version uh, that, that is possible. One other historical point I'll mention is that there are some national leaders and presidents who seem fated and inevitable. Uh, that um, the Bush family, well, you know, there are people who have been sort of, you could see their candidacies coming a long time away. And there are others that are more or less accidental. I worked for Jimmy Carter long ago. Three years before the day he was sworn in, nobody would have thought he would end up as president. 
Barack Obama, five years before he was sworn in, nobody would have thought that. Four years before, they would have because of his convention debut. And so it's possible that there can be another leader who has an experience and message and personality that will match a sense that things can be better than they are. I'm not saying we wait for the new savior, but I'm saying that is a predictable part, or it's a, an observable part of American history that these people do appear, and that meanwhile, it is worth trying to do as much as possible to have these laboratories of democracy and of economics and of engagement and of education city by city, as was the case a century ago. There's an alternative path, which my very dear friend Cullen Murphy, who was for 20 years uh, Bill's um, managing editor of the Atlantic, says might be the other plan B for our current politics, which is that we recognize pretty soon that national politics has finally broken. That a constitution written in the 1780s simply cannot match the needs of a country like this. And so he says this could bring on something like um, the dark ages, but in a nice way, by which he means <laughs> something like after the fall of the Roman Empire, you didn't have central authority anymore, but there were still lots of little baronies that kept going quite well. And these little baronies had their artistic culture and their food and their monasteries. And so Collins is saying, well, if the local examples don't save national politics, at least then if national politics fails, we can have, these, uh, we can have the good side of the Dark Ages. So whichever of those hypotheses is true, I think it makes, in either case, it's all the more important to cultivate, put a spotlight on, and try to connect the people who are doing things city by city. And that's something that Deb and I plan to do for the foreseeable future, to try to just connect people in Little Rock, in El Dorado, with their counterparts in Butte, or in Orem, Utah, or in Pensacola, where I was two days ago, and, and who knew all the stuff was going on in Pensacola. And so I think that this is the, our, our mission for the next while is to try to make people aware of this other face of the current American uh, reality. One, a minute and a half now on how this is all is knit back into to journalism. A natural question you may be asking yourself at this moment is, how the hell can any of this be true? If there's a country where there was an American carnage narrative very recently, and we saw the kinds of, uh, there was a sense, there was a journalistic a wave after the election to go back and see how, how unhappy people really were out there uh, for, for concept stories. How can it be that I'm saying there is positive momentum in many places? And I think the answer, my, my hypothesized answer, has a lot to do with journalism. That something about the journalism at the national level of this era has fed the tendency for national politics to become more and more disconnected from anything real. It's increasingly tribal and religious and resentment-filled and zero-sum and retrib you know, retribution-minded and different from the way most people exist in most of the rest of their lives. Of course, there are all those emotions in everybody's daily life. There are problems in every city and every family but something has made it even more disconnected. And we observed this by, when we went from city to city, never answer, asking people about national politics. Because we knew as soon as we did that, it would be like turning on the TV. And every, you, you would never hear anything you didn't already know or had already heard. Instead, ask them, what about the schools? Who's moving to town? How are you dealing with these refugees? What city are you like? What city do you fear, et cetera? And there you could find people being willing to, to deal um, reasonably. So the simultaneous with the, what I'm describing as the effort to promote the bottom up healthy part of the American civic fabric, there is some attention and effort needed by political leaders and people in my business of journalism, business many people here too, and education, to think of where the break points are that can somehow change this cycle in which it just is like religious war. 
and it just is is entirely a matter of if you lose, I win, and vice versa, and that there's uh, there's no area of area for for uh, compromise. The the answer to that is, of course, a 10 years long discussion by all of us about economic models and about shoring up local journalism and about personal reading habits and about ways that, that cable news tries to reinforce some line between entertainment and, and information and, and all the rest. But I lay this out just as a way of drawing a marker between a problem I am, am recognizing is a truly major problem which is the disease of our national level politics and the information uh, system that is supporting that and the rest of the national fabric. Because this first problem is a genuine problem in any circumstances, but I think we can think of it in different ways if you recognize it as being not the entirety of civic life, which is what most people now infer they think that their cities are these isolated anomalies and that every place else must be like the Congress. And I'm saying the Congress is like the Congress, House of Cards is like House of Cards, but most of the country is still something different. And the effort to maintain, strengthen, and promote the something different involves journalism and involves a lot else. It involves, crucially, libraries. So that comes back to our meeting here at the library. I appreciate your coming out to the library this evening, having me here for this lectureship. I'll be answer, happy to answer uh, polite, uh, politely inquisitive questions, uh, observations, anything else, but uh, thank you all for having me here. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. If you want to ask a question, please come to one of the two microphones here so everybody can hear. And also, uh, Jim has given us permission to record this. It'll be on the library's website uh, for people who weren't fortunate enough to be here tonight to review and be inspired by what he's just told us. So come up and ask questions. And I'll take absence of questions as assent to all points. So, so sorry our time here is up. <laughs> So what determined how long you would stay at a particular town? Was, did that yeah. just arise? Was it different? Or how did you decide that? So it's a good question. I didn't talk mechanics of what we were doing just for time, but I'll give you a little bit of the mechanics. We would, the places, there are about 25 cities that we gave some extended treatment to in our, books, in our book, and those pl were places we'd been for at least two weeks. And usually it was two one-week time. So we had a real combination of... Um, method and throwing darts at a board to figure out where we're going to go. We ended up being in, in the Golden Triangle of Mississippi for a long time purely by chance that some guy there wrote and said, you think Greenville, South Carolina is so hot, you better come here to Columbus, uh, Mississippi and then see our, our school. So we would typically have a little bit of email contact with people before we got there. We'd usually fly our little plane in on a Sunday afternoon um, we try to figure out how to get from the airport to the Motel 6. This was before Uber for the first couple of years. And there was one time in a venue I won't mention where there was this, we, the only way we could get in from the airport after a fish fry was in this pickup truck sitting on the back of bales of hay with this, this guy who was literally had a you know, hay thing that he was chewing as he drove. And he's a guy who I don't think had finished any grade of school at all. But uh, we'd get into, school, uh, into town, we'd stay at the motel. The next day, usually we'd try to go to the library, the newspaper editor, the mayor, school principal or something, and just uh, try to ask people, what's happening here? What's the story? what's good and bad in the city and just fan out. And by the end of the first week, we usually thought, geez, there's a million things here more to, to find out. So we would then go someplace else or go home and then come back for another week. So usually it was two weeks and for the first day or two, Deb and I would be together and then we'd fan out. She would do interesting things like um, you know, libraries and art centers and I would do the factory and the, uh, the, the, the startup zone and the tech center. But, and, we, and then we get together 
each evening in the brew pub and say, you won't believe what we saw this day. So that was the approach. We have a question over here, Charlie. Yeah. Mr. Fallows, I, I'm from Northeast Arkansas. I grew up in a newspaper publishing family. And <clears throat> my question uh, really revolves around the disappearance of community newspapers. Uh, it's a great, greatly distressing thing to realize that most of the weekly newspapers in Arkansas have disappeared. And uh, part of that is technology, but part of that is a change in reading habits, and part of that is uh, they, they want more entertainment and less news. But my father had the philosophy that the community newspaper was a service for the community. And there were many times when someone from the school board said, you better be here when we meet because it's going to be a, an important issue. And he would report it whether they wanted to hear the results or not. But we're, we're lacking the, the communities that, that used to thrive that no longer have the newspapers, no longer have somebody to promote their schools, their athletic departments, their libraries, their industrial growth, and they were just withering away. Um, I, I agree that this is a genuine problem and crisis of, of the era, which is the economic basis and other connections of, of community newspapers. We found a number of places where, with sort of anomalous successes of the local paper, um, some in Vermont, some in Western Pennsylvania, some in California, where for particular local circumstances, um, often it was the case that former alt-weeklies had evolved in a way that took over a previous sort of normal, quote, normal, unquote, journalistic operation. But yes, I agree, the economic pressures on the whole media business in general, news, newspapers more particularly, and small newspapers most of all, those are a genuine nationwide, um, uh, I'm not going to say disaster, but, 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 but big problem. My hometown paper in California, the Redlands Daily Facts, which was my very first journalistic job of doing high school sports and being a paper boy, that's now owned by the same chain that has the Denver papers and just you know, trying to grow by, by cutting to maintain a high profit margin. The, the only response I have here is, is to the growing recognition that this is actually an emergency and that the, the amount of money that it would take to shore up a lot of these publications is not very much in the big scheme of things. Um, I'll, I'll give this example that there was some calculation maybe five or ten years ago that the amount of money, this was before Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, the amount of money it would take to endow the Washington Post forever would be equivalent to the endowment of like the 200th richest universities. University, you know, it's way down the chain. Universities have a lot more of, of the money. And I think that the, 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 there is, is increasing attention being directed to this by organizations like Report for America. When we were in West Virginia, I, we saw a number of reporters from the Charleston paper who were there, a version of the Peace Corps, sending young reporters there, finding ways to have some counterpart to um, these service corps of, for retired executives of having older sub-100 reporters and editors go out to some of these uh, papers and, and give them their advice, of having uh, today's plutocrats recycle some of their money this way as the plutocrats of 150 years ago recycled it into museums and universities and, and art troops and all the rest. So yes, this is a problem. There is a lot of attention and experimentation being uh, directed to it. And over the next, through the course of this year, I, I know of like four or five other sessions I'll be at where people are going to be trying to address this particular problem. Mr. G is going to show us the example of how they do it at the Clinton School. If you have a question, you don't want to get up and come out here, we'll bring you the microphone. Raise your hand. There you go. It's on right back down. Get you. <clears throat> um, 
I guess I want to hear more about the role libraries are playing yeah. in some of these different communities yeah. and just if you could elaborate on that. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is something, uh, again, I'll try to channel Deb, who has a really um, winning and engaging presentation on the role of libraries. And I think she usually says there are three broad categories in which, in which we saw libraries doing inventive things. Um, one of them, and, and this is even, well, I guess, one of them is, is internet connectivity in general. That a, a, an underappreciated inequality in America, I don't know how it applies here, but it, it applies in most of non-coastal America, is that there's a lot of the country that just doesn't have good internet access. And that in, you can hardly imagine that in New York or San Francisco where you whine if you know your phone takes a nanosecond to get a, a new map, but it's just you know, there's a lot of the country where where the libraries are a leading source of internet connection, and there are many many cities where the way we would use the internet it would be to sit on the sidewalk outside the public library at night and just you know log in that way because there was no other way we could get uh, connectivity, and so you s libraries are are deliberately incorporating this as part of their their role. Um, so that is, is one, one function. There's a way in which libraries have recognized that their current mission involves a lot more purposeful civic engagement. Uh, Deb has a story about the Deschutes County Library System in Oregon that was upset four or five years ago to learn that people didn't know what the library did. And so they renamed themselves community librarians and they just made a point of being members of every single group that existed in Deschutes County. And, and they would have uh, dance classes at the library and they'd have ESL classes and they'd have all sorts of other things. And we've seen versions of that where, where libraries try to think of what is a connection to the city. You saw the New York Times story a couple days ago that the New York public library system will lend you a necktie and a briefcase and a suit coat to people going on job interviews. And there are things like that all over the place. In Duluth, Minnesota, the public library will lend you seeds for vegetables and flowers if at the end of the season you bring seeds back. Uh, the um, Deb's hometown of Vermilion, Ohio, they lend you fishing poles to go fish on Lake Erie. Uh, there are- We've got those here. Okay, good. <laughs> so it's, uh, so that, and then there's a lot of, I, I didn't talk about community colleges, which are, are one of my along with libraries, one of the big heroes of modern American life in my view. But I think both libraries and community colleges are very much involved in trying to equip people for different lives. Um, the leading search question, at least when Deb was looking into this for internet searches at public libraries is, how do I find a job in X field? You know, it's job search questions along with What's this thing on my arm, and should I see a doctor, et cetera? And when Deb was in the public library in Columbus, Ohio, which is a really impressive system, over the main door of the Columbus Library, it has the words, open to all, and it, it lives that, that motto. And there was, uh, Deb was watching somebody talk about um, people going in there for job searches, and the librarian was telling the person how to fill out a job form that he saw on the internet and the librarian came back and the guy had filled out the form on the computer screen because he just you know didn't that was uh, sort of where he was in the adjustment process and so if we were impressed by the ways in which libraries were finding the aspects of their communities that were the squeaking wheels or the the needful places in their communities whether it was engagement uh taking having a place for, for young people to go, ESL, whatever. And then of course the homeless factor that is a reality for many libraries and finding ways to balance open to all with, with a manageable public space. I have a question right here. Yeah. Uh, I'm very proud you're here. In fact, Nate called me one day and I just got finished reading your book. I was in Florida reading it. And uh, I told Nate, I, I said, we've got to get the files mm -hmm. to come. He said, this very morning on I just got the confirmation mm -hmm. you're going to be here. Um, as a mayor of a city, uh, your book is very inspiring to me, I'll tell you right now. Uh, you know, after you're in office a while, all you hear is problems, 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 and you focus on fixing what's wrong. You don't have to fix what's right because it's right. 
And, uh, you know, you get beat up and get beat up. Social media has taken the place of newspapers. It's the gospel now, of course. But uh, the, the thing about I really appreciate the fact is you realize that uh, everyone in your community points out the warts, and you think you've only got the warts, and you realize we all got warts. And, uh, but the uh, issue that, that uh, our town was a small town back in the 50s, about 2,500 people, and had an airbase come, so retail always follows rooftops. And our town exploded in the 50s, and then the retail developed in the 60s, which happened to be the shop center era. And of course, shopping centers are ugly things now, obviously. Uh, in your town, your travels of about the 30 cities that you went to, uh, Main Street, everybody in that town owns Main Street, whether you're the richest yeah. person or the poorest yeah. person, because that, your Main Street identifies who you are as a community. What, what are the, the communities that you're going to? What have they done that had situations like us? But, and also it's compounded by the fact that we got the internet sales, which are killing small businesses. Yes. And so it, this is going to be a complicated and compound problem in the future. So you might want to do another book five years from now and address the same issue. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. And, and which town is yours? I'm sorry, I don't. Oh, sure. Good. Um, Jack, he's from, that's Gary Fletcher from Jacksonville, yes. Arkansas. For those of you who didn't yes. hear his answer to, to Jim. So the, the, the situation of the downtowns was another genuine surprise to, to both of us because um, the dominant pattern of 50s and 60s architecture, of course, was these sprawl malls, uh, interstates, bypasses, giant parking lots, and city after city just had, had these eroded downtowns. Allentown, PA, we spent a lot of time in Allentown, and their problem was not the steel mills so much. You know, they have a diff, sort of they shifted to a different different economic base. It's that their what had been a historically vibrant downtown was just gutted by these out of town malls. The same thing happened in Fresno. Uh, it happened in San Bernardino. It happened in other places. And I think that that in a, to a degree I hadn't anticipated what that sprawl movement was to the 50s and 60s. A re downtowning is to to right now. Um, I'll give you the extreme example and then some, some details. New York Magazine had an insufferable article last week from somebody who'd gone around the country and said how tedious it was that every little downtown had a coffee shop and a brew pub and that people were walking around and this was so, you know, so derivative. You know, that, that, why don't they just go to, go to Brooklyn? Which I thought, number one, <laughs> You know, my first reaction was, go to hell. My, <laughs> my second reaction was, this is a million times better than having Applebee's and Chili's and all the rest, which were the, what these are replacing. And number three, this sameness, which was so wearying to the person from, from uh, I think she called it the unbearable sameness of, uh, of, you know, reviving small towns. It was so unbearable. If you go to France, this is charming, that in every little town there's a patisserie and a boulangerie and all the rest. And so the equivalent of the patisserieing of America is, is happening. And the, the, uh, there are a lot of organizations that are pushing this very hard. The um, Main Street America Alliance, which you probably know of, which is a, a subset of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, the dynamic, and I mentioned both Allentown and Fresno, they both are in the middle of really major downtown revivals where they have companies coming back downtown, residential coming downtown because the young people want to live downtown and so do the old people, uh, and having uh, stores and, and, and retail and, and all the rest. And what we observed is that in a surprising amount of the country, the classic downtown architecture from like 1850 to 1930, a lot of it is still there. You know, that some of it was bulldozed, but a lot of it may be covered with aluminum sidings, it may be vacant, but it's there to be reused. And so a lot of the U.S. now is having enough of this downtown rebirth is going on that New York Magazine can make fun of it. <laughs> you know, that, to me, that, that's a sign of, of success that places are going from the Applebee's and the Chili's to having uh, these places uh, that are distinctive to the downtowns. And so I think it's a long slog Internet sales are a big issue, requires sort of uh, figuring out what is the key in each town. Uh, but, but we thought this was a, a, the tide was moving in that direction as opposed to in, in the mall direction. Jim, there's a gentleman back here who wanted me to ask you 
What are some of the things you recall where people were uh, exuberantly proud of something locally? Maybe it was even humorously so, but some of the things that you recall people being very, very proud yes. of. Something we resolved not to do in our travels was the equivalent of world's largest ball of twine. <laughs> you know, just these kind of oddball curiosities, the giant butter cow or whatever. Um, but we did see a number of, of oddities along the way. We were in Bellingham, Washington recently. Who knows the civic motto of Bellingham? I will give my, I'll give a handshake to anybody who knows. The answer is the city of subdued excitement. <laughs> so that was pretty odd. And they are, they're trying to follow the model of Bethlehem and Allentown, PA, the former U.S. Steelworks, the ones that Billy Joel sang about in, in uh, Bethlehem and Allentown, is now this beautiful concert venue. They call it Steel Sacks, and it's sort of like Stonehenge, where you have these ruins of the steelworks, and it's an art center, and it's a retail center, it's, it's, it's a, a happening thing. There's something similar in Birmingham, Alabama, and a former steelworks. And Bellingham has a former downtown paper mill, a giant, giant craft paper plant. And something I hadn't realized as a big part of a paper mill is this sphere about 40 feet in diameter, a really, really huge ball, whose, whose term is known as the acid ball. So this was where acid was used in the paper making plant. So their civic center is going to be the acid ball. They're going to make that the new symbol of Billingham, the city of subdued excitement. <laughs> Do you see public television as a bright spot? And comments no. on that? Yes, pu public broadcasting in general, TV and radio, is, is indispensable. You know, one of the interesting quirks of political war since Newt Gingrich's time onward is that Republican congressional delegations would often want in principle to cut public broadcasting because it was public, but then realizing it was often the main uh, stalwart of, of rural communities, and it was relatively more important in smaller towns than, than in bigger towns. So I think the um, public broadcasting, both radio and TV, has its own funding dramas and governance dramas and all the rest. I've done a lot of work for NPR over the decades, and I often think it would be better if they got no congressional funding at all, because the minority of congressional funding that they get exposes them just to nonstop political whipsawing of how can you criticize person X, you must be a tool of the liberal media. And I, I think that, that um, I don't know the funding of public TV as well as I know of NPR, but I, I think that, that in this envisioned brighter time of American possibility. We can find ways to think about experimental ways to support public TV, public, uh, public internet uh, streaming, and public radio because their audiences, to the best of my knowledge, continue to grow and that the, the amount of money required is not that much from the standards of modern people with money. So yes, these are important and I am for them and I give to them. Here's one question. Tell them the funny stories about Billy Joel's relationship with the leaders of Allentown. Yes. So who here has heard the song by Billy Joel, Allentown? You know, or it's, you know, they're closing all the factories down. What do you think is the least popular song in the city of Allentown, BA? <laughs> it is Billy Joel's Allentown. The reason is, number one, where are these mills? These mills are in Bethlehem, PA. They are not in Allentown. So that's number one, they're saying they are tarred as sort of the closed coal mine of, of the song era because for something that's not even in their town. They're having you know, the three towns there, it's Allentown, Bethlehem, and Easton. So that's their one problem. Their second and more heartfelt complaint is, as the uh, city council chairman there, Julio Garidi, told me, is the only reason the song says Allentown is that nothing rhymes with Bethlehem. And, the, and it's just, so their town became this loser town because you couldn't rhyme Bethlehem. So that's, uh, that's, that's the, the heartbreak of Allentown.
Let's give uh, Mr. Fallows a big round of applause. Thank you all. Oh.